Behind me, I have the Anker F3800 Plus Smart Home Power Kit. This is one of the most reliable, versatile, modular, scalable, and affordable energy backup systems for whole home or partial home on the market today. It's at a price point not seen before. It has functionality through the roof. Here we go. The Anchor Solix comes with the Smart Home Kit. I'm gonna show you how this baby works. It's pretty sweet, very clean, has a nice aesthetic appearance, very user friendly. I'm gonna show you how to plug those babies in. Those are CTs, current transformers, and they're ready out of the box, real straightforward. Our electrical components today include some three quarter inch EMT, coupling, connectors, 90s and if you're not an electrician you might be wondering what are those they're reducing washers also a real straightforward component nifty 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 i've got my three quarter inch emt bender and some auxiliary emt just in case i run into some offsets in 90s that i cannot easily accommodate with my factory components however factory components are extremely diy friendly and will create an easy installation for you. Now it might sound like I'm getting excited about something that's pretty minute here, but if you look at the suite of components that actually came with my Anchor Solix and Smart Home Power Kit, I, I just have to comment, when has a manufacturer ever sent you an Eaton main lug 125 amp panel with, as you'll notice, label kit, cover screws, and an independent auxiliary ground bar, because that is a sub panel, so neutrals and grounds will be separated as I'll show you, and a 100 amp breaker. That's right, it all comes with the kit. Super impressed. In addition, there's an installation guide, a warranty guide, and a user guide, all with QR codes, very well written. A mounting template with hardware and your mounting brackets. It's, it's ready to go out of the box. And so am I. Let's rock. Little diagram we put together on the glass board. It's always best to begin with the end in mind. This is what we're looking at. Through the course of this project, we'll uncover the unknown unknowns, share those with you, and you'll be equipped start to finish to install your own Anchor Solix F3800 Plus Smart Home Power Kit. If you're curious about a look inside the Smart Home Power Kit, here it is. But you don't have to remove the cover, don't be intimidated. I just like to look around and know what I'm dealing with. I'm gonna bend my own parts here. That's too aggressive. By the time I 90 and kick it out, and then put this 45 on it, I'm too far off the wall. But one thing about the Anchor Solix Smart Home Kit is that the knockout is about four inches off the wall. So the setup as prescribed by Anchor ends up being a full circle. I'm gonna start with this side of the circle first because this bend with offset will be the most tricky, and I don't wanna get stuck having done all of this with some dimensions that are a non-starter down here. So I'm gonna take my three quarter inch EMT and bender, electrical metallic tubing EMT, and I'm gonna bend a 90 with a kick, give it a little trial and error. I've got a full 10 foot stick here and I need about 12 to 14 inches. So if I don't get it right the first time, there's some forgiveness. I'm gonna be bending up my EMT, electrical metallic tubing, with my EMT bender. It is size specific. Every bender is sized to the conduit. The trick is nice, heavy foot pressure combined with leverage from the handle on a level surface. The radius of a three quarter inch EMT bend is marked on the side of the bender and is six inches. I'm gonna bend it to a vertical Check level. I've got it there. Remove the bender. Now I need a kick. The kick is going to allow me basically uh, a custom offset. So what I'm looking at here is sliding my bender onto the conduit. I want my handle to be in a perpendicular plane from my conduit. I'm gonna give it a little trial and error here. EMT is pretty forgiving. 
If I overbend or underbend, I can come back to it and adjust it later. So what I have here is an inch and a half kick. Inch and a half is not gonna be enough. That's the distance from the wall to the inside of the conduit. I'm gonna just measure and see what I need for my anchor solex. The space for the brackets, these French cleats. So we've got three quarter there up to seven eighths. There's a little bit of intentional play in those brackets. Plus the dimension on the unit itself. I'm gonna call that, I am using reducing washers so I'm not measuring to the back side of the hole. I'm gonna call it three and a quarter. Four inches, bit strong. There is an eighth inch of play. So again, with heavy pressure on the shoe, I need a four inch offset in this dimension here from my floor to the underside of my conduit. Before I go too far, let's give that a look. All right, that's gonna be pretty close. I'm actually gonna knock out my knockouts and assemble this with the option of coming back and again, giving that a little bit more love if required. Fittings like this are required to be tool tight or wrench tight. So what I like to do is have my fitting about 90 degrees shy of where it's gonna land when it's hand tight, then coming back with channel locks, bringing that set screw straight out and perpendicular to the wall for a nice clean finished look. Let's go with a trial fit here. This is where the reducing washers come into play. I'm gonna lay these out so that on the outside, oh, not even required, look at that. Just a single set. There we go, here, inside. Repeat the procedure. The reducing washer is too big for the space, so I'm actually gonna take my bandsaw to it, trim it down, and then it'll be a nice custom fit. Trial fit. Oh man, that's gonna be pretty darn close by the time you account for that seven eighths right there. Yeah, you can just fit, fit a finger back there. Yeah. All right, let's get our mounting brackets up using the mounting template. So you'll see that the mounting template is smaller than the unit itself. So I'm really not sure how to use it. I'm thinking there is a conference and at the conference table, everybody involved in this project was, you know, reviewing the final punch list and, and there was a template left undone. Nobody had been assigned and they didn't have an intern available. So the executive said, um, you know, never mind, I'll handle it. And like every good executive uh, handling menial tasks, uh, blew it off. <laughs> so now we have an, what I perceive to be an unusable template. Let's go trial fit. Pull that up there. Put a level on top. Get this dial in. Mark the corners. Okay, time to put the second French cleat on back here, and then we can continue our mechanical installation and then move on to the wiring. Quick note, I always like wearing my cut resistant gloves. Maxi Flex has a high degree of flexibility on the gloves. Just a great fit. However, around rotational tools, if that glove catches, Man, you can sure put some torque on your fingers. So go slow, exercise caution, and keep your gloves clear of rotational tools. There are set screws provided by Anchor that install in the brackets back here to prevent this from being accidentally lifted off its mounts. A little bit more layout work here. One thing you're gonna ask about securing and supporting conduit, I, yeah, I knew you were gonna ask that, is uh, how? How do I do it? And does it, is it required? The answer is yes, it is absolutely required. The code is really specific about it. Conduit shall be supported within three feet of terminations. So the question is, 
at any point along the length of this conduit that I've got here, am I more than three feet from terminations? And the answer is no. So that will remain unsecured and unsupported other than terminations, but it's quite solid. If this was a concentric knockout with larger sizes and this conduit became stressed, knockouts are intended to, that's right, knock out. So I could lose that connection, but I've got a three quarter inch connector and a three quarter inch knockout. It's real solid and surrounded by steel. So love it. This is what I'm gonna do with this sub panel is I'm gonna line up three quarter inch knockout with three quarter inch knockout and edge with edge. And we're gonna get the most aesthetically pleasing and convenient installation here. So I'll match the edges, set a level, pencil a line, and then line these knockouts up. My level's too long to fit in between these boxes once installed, so I'm just gonna give myself a level line to follow, and then cut a piece of conduit to fit with my connectors in place. Raise and lower my box. I've got my left edge and my level, and that will determine the placement of my sub panel. Again, provided by Anchor. Yes, the sub panel is provided by Anchor, plus the little bits and pieces that are required in the sub panel that would have you run in here and there to the hardware store, mid project, disrupting your success. Thank you, Anchor. Okay. Now this panel is energized, I have to say, whenever possible, de-energize electrical components. Do not work on live parts. Those mains are, that's 100 amp, bro, it's coming right off the meter. I've got a dedicated transformer to my house. That's right, a dedicated utility transformer for my 1,000 amp service. Ah, uh, really? <laughs> that was like my birthday present to myself. I stayed up 23 and a half hours straight to install that electrical service. It was super epic. Came across some old house challenges. If you've not seen that video, click here. But it does cost me a dollar and 50 cents on a special metering rate to charge my two Teslas for 450 miles each of city driving. That's kind of crazy. It's that one, right? I'll just hold it up there again, double check. It is that one. So this is concentric knockout. So you'll see it's got a one inch, three quarter inch, half inch. If I'm not careful, I'll knock that one inch out and I'll need some more reducing washers. So I'm gonna take it slow. There goes my half. Come back nice and easy. Try to just pull out that three quarter, come on. Some knockouts are like practically drill outs. They're so tough. Just gotta put the ear protection on them and just wail on them with a four pound sledge. But some knockouts like this one are a little bit more tenuous and you've got to be genteel, slow and patient. So again, tool tight, wrench tight. Bring it to 90, whoop, 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 whoop. Put the channel locks on there and gently, slowly bring it home to perpendicular. I like to put my finger in there. Look at that, just a little thing to keep from dropping your lock nut. Spin it off, boom, you've got a captive lock nut. All right, the length I need is seven and three quarter, less the shoulder width. You can see where it flares a little bit at that connector right there. That's what I call the shoulder, right? So I actually need to be here, not tight to the panel. So that is a real dimension of seven and three quarter. I'm gonna cut it seven and nine sixteenths. Conduit does need to be reamed, various types of reaming tools. That's the inside, outside. It's actually a, a plumbing tool. But man, it was cheap, it's quick, it's durable, done. You don't wanna have any abrasive edges on the inside that'll cut your wire or on the outside that'll prevent your fittings from seating. Here we 
There we go. Great. And one of the nice things about the depth of the conduit fitting is I actually have just about an eighth of an inch left I can slide and I've got plenty of play such that the set screw will still fully engage each conduit and um, in good shape. Anchor does have an antenna on top of the smart home kit so you'll want to leave enough space for that booger to receive signal. Same gig, let's saw it down. Another custom washer. All right, I'm gonna use a straight run of pipe to connect these two, and then I'm gonna have to pull them out, put the pipe in, and then slide them both in from the side so my total dimension on my setup is going to be 25 and a half. Let's go some pipe. It's kind of a cumbersome way of doing it, but it gets the job done. It's compression fittings are a tight fit. Contrary to what can be popular belief at times, compression fittings are not watertight or outdoor rated. You require a rain tight compression fitting, which comes with an auxiliary gasket for exterior use or a concrete tight compression type fitting for in concrete use. And they're slightly color coded. The rain tight ones have a bluish hue typically, and the concrete ones are often brown. There it is. <clears throat> Another reason to line up the left edges of your units Nice clean finished look to your pipe. We've got breakers, filler plates, crimp terminals, and a decor raised four inch cover. $9.68. My grandpa told me you used to be able to walk into a Home Depot with a couple bucks in your pocket, walk out with two sticks of conduit, a pack of wire nuts, a dozen breakers, maybe even a breaker panel. Nowadays, they have those darn security cameras all over the place. No, but in all seriousness, this old wise fish is swimming down the stream and he's met by these two young salmon swimming past him. And he says, fellas, how's the water today? The fish are silent and they swim on by. And after a moment's pause, one young fish turns to the other young fish and says, what the heck is water? <laughs> Back to work. We're getting close. I'm gonna add an outlet off the side of the panel here that can carry some loads for me connected to a 20 amp breaker. I'm using an offset nipple, which is really handy because a lot of times the knockouts on the box and the panel, see that, they don't match up. So I can't just use a straight piece of conduit like this. That's where the offset nipple comes in. Boom. There goes my receptacle. It's wired in start to finish in case you've not done a receptacle. I've got a couple pro tips for you to prevent code violations and frustrations if you're doing this project yourself. I've got a little handy dandy off topic thing to show you here. Leviton's got these new 15 amp tamper resistant 125 volt receptacles with some magic on the backside here. Lever lock. It's a toolless. You open it. Yes. Stick it in the back and you close it. Boom. I wouldn't trust shark bites. As a team member of ours said, we don't backstab each other. We don't backstab our outlets. However, this is a mechanical lever with a higher degree of reliability than a traditional receptacle backstab. Look at that. Whew. Wow. The screw through the cover. It's a 632 with a nut. 6-32 on the back, which is the screw that the receptacles come with. It's only an okay connection. There's a little spring on the back of the... There's our backed up receptacle. Now we'll terminate this end. This is 12 gauge solid. So go to your 12 gauge marking, strip the appropriate length, terminate to breaker, 
and ground. I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to get this auxiliary ground bar in there because if you look closely, only one of the two mounting holes is going to line up. So what I'm going to have to do here is drill and tap the second hole. Here's a driller impact. Both have speed control. Some of the newer ones have torque control as well. So the reason I need an auxiliary ground bar, which again was provided by Anchor, is that neutrals and grounds are separated after the first means of disconnect. The first means of disconnect in this case is my trailer panel on the outside of the carriage house, about 30 wire feet from here. So both of these panels have separated grounds and neutrals. The reason for that is you don't want neutral current traveling across your grounding components. See, all of this is grounded, 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 right? So what could actually happen, hey, let's say that set screw was ever loose right there and there was neutral current flowing across this connection, you could actually see in some cases, and I've seen it before, that there's arcing actively taking place right there because of a poor connection between two steel fittings. It's arcing, it's turning black, you can hear the crackle, the sizzle, the pop, you can physically see the sparks. No bueno, watch out man. Here goes the drill and tap on the second one. So I'm gonna go low pressure, low speed, low torque, take it easy, be patient. <laughs> That's me being patient. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Easy. All right. It's hard to get it lined up perfectly because the tolerance is so tight, unless you do one, and then with the ground bar fixed in place, install the second. So now I've got a main terminal at the top, which is really handy. This green screw over here, I will be removing because that will not be installed. If that's installed, then what happens here is that the neutral bar, which is all of this, jumping across to here and up there, all this neutral, plus the plug-in neutral bar on the side, all of that becomes bonded to the cabinet, which becomes bonded with all the grounding components, and I've created a hazard and a violation. One of the things DIYers often get frustrated about is these terminals. Some of them look like they're Phillips terminals and it almost fits. You could almost get the job done. I mean, it's turning, but you'd struggle to tighten it down. And that's because it's a slotted or straight blade or number two square. And that number two square is just such a beautiful thing. It grabs and holds like nobody's business. And there we have it. Terminate our breaker. Breaker's installed. This is how you install a breaker. They, they rock out, outside, inside, good pressure. If you're applying tremendous amount of pressure and just cannot get that thing to sit, then, Take a look at the stabs. Sometimes those stabs are out of alignment or compressed too tightly. And you've got to just real gently baby that thing into place. So that's a good fit, nice press fit. We'll take our conductor, our number two square, about a half inch of strip. There's a strip gauge on the side of nearly all breakers. Oh look, having to have a torque wrench sitting on my dry erase board with my markers just like every real electrician. The breaker is identified with its torque rating, which is 20 inch pounds. There we go, number two square. Boom, it's almost there. It's almost like you knew what I was doing. Now let's transfer a couple, one more backup circuit through this bridge conduit. And that backup circuit is gonna be our shot power. We're gonna take it all offline and run our shop off of the Anchor Solix F3800. So what's nice about these is they give you a readout. 15.4 hours left, 100% charge, current output wattage 152. I'm gonna be stealing the 60 amp breaker to feed my six gauge wire through my three quarter inch conduit on the line side of my smart home power. Now something to note is I've got a resource for you. 
This is wire sizing to code in Conduit, and you can use that as a quick reference when you're planning your system. Wire size is dependent on length, is dependent on current, and a variety of factors. And in fact, properly sizing wire is one of the most involved, complicated, and in-depth subjects in the code. It takes on a tremendous number of nuances in various circumstances, but the basic wire sizing chart has probably a 95% chance that it will be entirely applicable to your situation. Never wanna leave any wires uncapped. I'm gonna cap those and tuck them back out of the way. Then I'm gonna grab my circuit. This is gonna be hot, neutral, and ground. I'm gonna move all three over so that circuit remains terminated entirely in one location. And it, uh, in fact, before I do any more work in this panel, it is time to de-energize it. Let's walk outside and kill the main for it. Back inside. Use my non-contact voltage detector and it's off. But you wanna test on a known live source before and after. So here we go. Here it is, turns red, so it's working. Come over here, double check. Yes, de-energized, as they say. If you get shocked, it's your own fault. Always have a reliable tester with you. This one's about 20 bucks. It is a Klein Tools tester, available at pretty much every Home Depot, online at Amazon. I wouldn't settle for the $6 tester when your life is on the line. Now let's pull the ground off here. To make a good wiring connection like this, take your strands and wrap them tightly. Take an appropriately sized wire nut. On the wire nut packaging, it will indicate the maximum gauge and maximum number of conductors that are allowed, as well as the minimum. This tan wire nut will work well with two number 12 grounds. Some jurisdictions, inspectors will be pretty particular about wiring connections made in electrical panels. However, in this jurisdiction, that's entirely allowable by code if the connections are properly made and if there is suitable room. There is a suitable amount of space in this panel because it's nearly empty. All right, we're just gonna extend and terminate that circuit over to this sub panel. Now this is an optional sub panel, it's not required for an anchor smart home energy installation. This smart home energy panel does function as an emergency disconnect with both, both a push button as well as a breaker style connection that controls the port on the same side of the panel. As an electrical contractor in Indianapolis, we do save our scrap wire. Believe it or not, we produce probably $35,000 a year of scrap steel, aluminum, and copper. Thanks for a decent Christmas party. Breakers come in the trip position. What a lot of people don't know is what a breaker's trip position looks like. It's right in the middle, so that's off, that's on, and that's trip. In order to reset a breaker, it has to go fully to the off position and then on. It will not go to the on position initially. What I'm gonna need to do is take this conduit system apart. I've never used these little fittings before. And if you're an experienced electrician, as you can guess, man, they're absolutely brutal. They're way too tight to fit the wire or the fish tape through. So we're gonna take it one step at a time. I've got three number six and one 10 gauge THHN conductor to fit through there. And I'm gonna need all the help I can get. So apart it comes. Put an identifier on it, both ends. All right, and this is coming to the backup side. L1 on the backup side, there it is. L2 with an identifier. Here's my number 10 stranded grounding conductor. 
the largest solid conductor that can be installed in a conduit system by code is 10 gauge. And I'll tell you what, if you do have large solid conductors in conduit, man, they're, they're gonna fight you. The stranded is very personable. Technically conduit systems are supposed to be complete as well before wiring is installed. But this UL listed fitting, it ain't gonna let that happen. All right, let's take a tool tight. Make it up on the other side. <laughs> oh, it's so tight. It's brutal when your video guy will not shut off the camera and has to catch all the crap that happens behind the scenes. Oh my gosh. An LB is what you're looking for. You might use an LL or an LR, but an LB is what you're looking for. And then uh, upsizing your conduit just a little bit will also provide a little bit of forgiveness because there's more conductor space. But why would I want to give up my reputation for struggling over the petty details when I can do that? Try to avoid damage to the conductors. So I keep the beater screwdriver around for just a nice big lug. Ah, nice wrench tight feel. All right, we're gonna install our CTs in the conduit now. We've gotta install the CTs first because of these chunky connectors. They will not go in after the wire's been installed. Now, I will admit, it didn't actually count on this step when I sized my conduit to three quarter. So I would recommend for this side of the equation, some nice, healthy one inch conduit. All right, so now we've got an L1, L2 situation here. So the CTs do require a small flat head. I'm gonna plug, it's a single, it's a directional CT connector, right? So I'm gonna take this one, plug it into L1, tighten down my screws. And before I do anything with L2, I'm gonna just identify this in the panel. Seesaw it back and forth. All right, I've got that L1. Now I take my L1 clamp, which is really nice. It's a split core CT, so you don't have to unland anything. In fact, that's really, really nice. There's an indication that the arrow on the CT points towards the breaker. It says source, but they show in the picture pointing towards the breaker. So I'm gonna try that on for size. And then easy, if it doesn't work and gives an improper reading, I'll just reverse the CT. But the direction of the CTs is very important. Here's my L2. Source sticker towards the breaker. So this is going to read current. It's a current transformer. As the current flows into my breaker, that's probably gonna show up in my app and be indicative of the entire power flow. Push my excess conductor out of here. I don't want my wiring compartment to be so crowded. Sitting here on a little shop stool, making our terminations. This is um, probably gonna be a handy way to execute on this project is utilizing this tool right here. It's real cost effective. It's a KFC P-Tech. KFC P-Tech and it's a crimper and it comes with a stripper and a variety of jaws for various size crimps. I just ran to the Home Depot to get my crimps. I need a 10 gauge here for my ground. 10 gauge is the code size for a 60 amp circuit like this. All right, let's give it a shot. I got some extras as far as extra wire and crimps just in case I make a mistake. Bing! Solid. That felt great. Yep. All right. KFC P Tech strikes again. Now, in number two, Phillips, to remove the terminal screw. This is a really reliable way of making a wiring connection with larger stranded conductors because the strands are all contained, right? Inside this insulator and inside the crimp. If you were trying to make a termination directly to that terminal without the stake on, uh, you'd really be in deep doo-doo. All right, so now my stripper does not go up to number six. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lightly ream the insulation and I'm actually going to feel when it makes contact with the copper. I'm going to stop so I don't score the copper. I'm going to install that there. Take my six gauge. Hope this is just a beautiful fit. Gonna bear down with both hands. Oh boy. Ah! We're able to remove the blue insulator entirely and that provided the relief that was required for the jaw to really have a nice total engagement with the stay con. Now I do wish I would have trimmed it short because you can see it's a little bit long. So I'm gonna just have to take that little bit extra, which is not a big problem, and wrap it in there to the terminal. Now I will say the KFC PTAC only goes up to six gauge. You have to go another route if you are running the full 100 amp capacity that the backup has, which is really impressive. It's not often that you've got a backup loads greater than 100 amps. And that might be uh, typical of electric heat. If you've got electric heat, that it will be pushing the total amount of backup capacity. 90 amps is real, real common. Hey, if you feel uncertain about doing a project of this size on your own, which I completely understand, I advise to you to check out solarreviews.com. We have a link in the description so that you can find a professional in the renewable energy market near you. So you might be asking the question, so how much of my house can I back up with the Anchor Solix F3800 and Smart Home Energy Panel? Well, the answer to that question is it depends, as always. I would feel comfortable putting a 30 amp air conditioner, 240 volt load on this panel, which is the most common size for an air conditioner or heat pump in our part of the United States of America. In addition, I feel comfortable putting some loads that are a little bit larger, but are individually controlled, such as your range. Your range is a two pole, 50 amp, 240 volt load. It's a big one. However, it's not common during an outage situation for you to be using more than one burner at a time. So that'll just be a fraction of the overall load. Most of the lights in your house can be easily backed up with your backup loads capacity. In addition, convenience outlets, television, gas furnace. I would be hesitant to charge an electric vehicle plus too many other loads simultaneously off of this. But in the case of a backup situation, it really will just be your backed up loads and anything you choose to plug into the side AC power ports of your F3800 battery unit. So that being said, 100 amp backup load, huge capacity, massive. This is one of the most cost-effective whole home backup solutions that I'm aware of. In addition, with a portable battery, you can take that battery with you for camping, glamping, the list goes on. It's tailgating, hunting, <laughs> you get the picture. Let's talk about L1 and L2. They can be confusing. See, the incoming wire at the top is L1. The second incoming wire, this guy here, is terminated to L2. Moving on down the ranks, it's alternating L1, L2, L1, L2. You can see from the configuration of the stab that a breaker on either side is going to plug in to the same phase. So in this case, L1 is top here. We track down L2, L1, L2, L1. So this yellow is now L1, which tracks through to the grid side. Anchor has labeled L1, L2, neutral and ground at the top. In addition, this side is grid, so there's yellow. Now on this side, this is L1, comes through our conduit up here to the first main terminal, L1, L2. So we've got a nice alternating sequence. Our neutral carries through and we're ready to put the panel covers on. I've got one thing I've got to show you about panel covers. As you're rearranging circuits, making entries, moving breakers, check this out. 
This is a code requirement and for good reason. That breaker space, because the breaker was relocated here, now constitutes a code violation. I've got to take an Eaton KO closer. One side pushes in, the other side snaps in and engages in order to prevent accidental contact with the live parts inside. If you don't do that, you'll be creating a hazard and it'll throw a flag on the field when you go to sell your home and the home inspector realizes eh, you failed to meet code. Let's now put the covers on. Actually, it's time to set up our photovoltaics. So the F3800 is a big boss battery. I mean, it's a two hand lift with your knees kind of gig, but it's got fantastic casters, basically doing donuts in the parking lot. It's got this handle right here. Oh, I thought it popped up, but I have to lift it. There it is. Look at that, just tip it back and you're off and running. It's not any heavier than your suitcase on your Hawaii trip. And then, in addition to that, you can lay it down like this. And there's a handle on the bottom too. That's pretty nifty. So here we go, it's time to fire up the system and see how it all works. Now it's time to plug in our BHC. See what our fit here is. Reverse 180. Oh yeah, there it, oh, that was gratifying. That's it. Let's have an orientation to the fit, open the compartment. Orientation here as well. I figured this out. Boom. We are now connected. More aspects to the F3800. It does come with a three-way splitter of MC4 connectors, both male and female. MC4 is a standard format for renewable energy and owns most of the market share for making photovoltaic connections. It also arrives, of course, with a 120 volt power cord for charging from shore power, which is convenient for any mobile application. I have to say the Anchor F3800 is a super incredible, portable, convenient, modular, scalable, whole or partial home battery backup solution. I do have five points of feedback for Anchor here. First, a full size template instead of the little eight and a half by 11 would have been very helpful. Second, standard depth knockouts. You'll see if you look over here that I did have to take my EMT bender and bend a custom offset in order to arrive here. I get that the back of the panel is used for components, but it's not quite as DIY friendly for some installations. Thirdly, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi connection. Absolutely a must. Fourth, XT60 to MC4 connection. I happen to have one on hand. The battery in the system was not supplied with one in order to connect my south facing solar panels to the battery it was required. Fifth and final, the app had a few bugs. It was really user friendly from the standpoint of layout and user interface, but we kept running into roadblocks and having to overcome. I expect within the next couple of weeks and firmware upgrades, that'll be entirely resolved. If you happen to be starting an electrical contracting business, check the description. There's a link for you. We've got a free platform that's coming. If you sign up now, you'll have early access. And did I mention free? And in addition, don't forget the last step. Subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.